Hello, NG Houston. So we're back tonight for the second episode of Denny's Angular JS upgrade series. And uh, this is pretty exciting stuff. Um, so I wanted to introduce a new panelist that we have who has not joined us before. We're really excited to have Joshua. Joshua, you want to say hi? Yeah, hey you guys. My name is Joshua Godai um, out of St. Louis. I'm the principal UI engineer at Bullhorn. Uh, I also run the Angular meetup here in St. Louis as well. Um, and basically just uh, Angular expert at my company and sort of lead front end development and architecture. Uh, and I also am an instructor at Oasis Digital. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate you being here. We, we try to always have a panelist from Oasis Digital whenever possible <laughs> because you guys are, are pretty much rock stars. So uh, we really appreciate you guys showing up. And you guys know Denny. Denny, you want to take it away and show us some cool stuff again? Yep. Thanks, Bonnie. And thanks, Joshua, for being here. Um, so tonight, uh, let me go ahead and uh, kick over to the presentation. Tonight, we're in our second episode. And we're going to start to discuss the tooling that we'll use to do our Angular development. So um, coming from an Angular JS background, we know that uh, when we first started doing Angular JS, we really just needed to know JavaScript, and we just write our JavaScript files. And uh, as long as we sequence those properly in our script tags, in our entry XML or, or entry HTML file, we knew that uh, our application would run. Well, things have changed a bit in front-end development since then, and Angular is part of that new env environment as well. So tonight we want to take a look at some of those new tools and the new things we need to be aware of as we do Angular development. So last week in our first episode, we covered a, a couple of steps in our a couple of sessions overall. We introduced the series, just talked about why we're here. If, if you were there, you remember that uh, a year ago at this time, we were just looking at what we could do as developers to prepare ourselves for Angular 2 development at that time. Um, and then this year, a year later, we've recognized that Angular is in full force and we've got a lot of Angular JS code out there in industry and we need to figure out a way to get from our Angular JS into an Angular environment, right? So we explored some of the migration paths and then we moved to our second session, which was a comparison between some of the Angular JS concepts that sorry you're not sharing uh -huh. your screen i don't think oh okay sorry sorry i should have stopped you sooner that's okay i just have a title slide going do you see blue yes blue yes okay, okay. how about this see Perfect. that now okay great thanks thanks bonnie so then we dove into a comparison between angular js concepts that we were familiar with and put them side by side with some of the new things that we're reading and seeing about Angular development. And try to figure out, well, where are these gaps? What's the same? What's missing? What's been changed completely? And um, how can we view some of that through an Angular JS lens? Because that's where most of us are coming from. So this week, we want to take a look at some of these tools that we're going to use to do our Angular development. So we want to get comfortable with those so that we can start to blend these two code bases together and have an amount of comfort with writing code in Angular. So tonight, we're going to look at uh, several things. We're going to start off by reviewing uh, what the new JavaScript is and then talk about TypeScript, do a little bit of demonstration of TypeScript, talk about the way that we build our front end apps. That's changed quite a bit in the past several years. And then we'll also talk about the Angular CLI, uh, which is a nice tool to facilitate Angular development. And we'll do a demo of that as well. So first, let's talk about JavaScript or ECMAScript 6. So JavaScript is changing a lot more quickly uh, in the past few years than it had uh, maybe in the past decade. Uh, so just to revisit, JavaScript is actually an implementation of a standard that's put out by this body called ECMAScript. So the ECMAScript standard uh, was at ES3 level back in 1999. 
And then in 2009, so a 10 year gap, uh, we, they actually skipped over ECMAScript 4, which was abandoned. And then it wasn't until June of 2015 where ECMAScript 6 came along and it had a lot of changes, a lot of things that people in software development world really wanted to bring to JavaScript because it would support enterprise scale applications. And by that, I mean applications which can grow to a scale that is still maintainable and easy to think through and understand and can be managed by even remote teams or even for yourself. Just some features that allow you as a developer to organize your code in a better way. So it makes the code more legible, really. Uh, it has less to do maybe with how the code runs in uh, execution environment, but it really improves the developer experience. So some of those new features were modules. So you can now take a JavaScript file and declare imports and exports. And uh, that, that helped because in the past, we may have to combine tons of JavaScript code in one single source file. And doing that, of course, makes it hard to find things as you're developing and changing. Uh, so now if you can break that into multiple files and then use these import and export statements to declare how things should be found that are dependencies from file to file, uh, that can really help, right? So we can organize our code a little bit better uh, in a file system. Um, it also included uh, classes. So classes, of course, are very traditionally uh, well known in traditional programming languages like object-oriented programming languages like Java or like uh, .NET. So this ECMAScript 6 standard brought classes to uh, JavaScript. And then we also have templates. So if you had ever tried to echo out messages or um, console logs, some information while debugging. Um, and you had some lengthy message where you had to include a lot of different variables. You know that in JavaScript or ES5, you would have to compose these cryptic lengthy strings and they were difficult to read and difficult to compose. Well, now there's uh, an ability to create these multi-string template, or sorry, multi-line strings to declare a template, which, uh, makes it a lot easier to write and to read your, your string templates. So the problem with using ECMAScript 6 today is that modern web browsers still don't know how to interpret it. So we can't just write our ECMAScript 6 uh, code and just run it in a web browser, it won't recognize it, right? So what we have to do is something called transpiling that source code into some format, which is really something like ECMAScript 5 or ES5, uh, that the browsers do understand in this in today's era. Um, so how do you do that? Well, you can transform that code um, into some module system like CommonJS or a RequireJS style using these transpilers like Tracer or Babel. You may have heard of those. Um, and then there are also a lot of plugins in some of our build tools like Grunt and Gulp that will allow you to uh, plug these transforming compilers or transpilers into your existing code or source code. Or we could just use TypeScript's TSC transpiler. So that is one of its own. So a year ago, when we started thinking about learning Angular 2, countless people and articles mentioned that the place to start was to learn TypeScript. So let's take a look at TypeScript. And what is TypeScript? So if we look at it in its simplest form, TypeScript is really just JavaScript plus typing information. So. TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, which means that anything you write in JavaScript could technically be considered TypeScript as well. So you write your source code in TypeScript, but it runs as JavaScript. So it would execute in your browser as just regular TypeScript. So a lot of people 
when they think about moving from JavaScript to TypeScript, uh, get a little bit or a little bit reluctant to introduce types into their coding, right? So let's look at some of the pros and cons of what it's like to code with types and without types. So without types, which is what we may be used to, it's easy to start and you don't really have to pay too much attention to the interface design between your functions and classes and objects. Um, you can just write them and it, it certainly seems faster at the time. Um, you don't have to put as much initial thought maybe into writing something that at least functions, right? But there's also some cons that come along with that. And the main one is that the, any errors that you write can really only be detected at runtime, um, not while you were developing. Um, there's a lot of time that you can waste consulting documentation or reviewing the dependency code tree that you may have created um, because you don't have the help of types. So with types, some of the negatives is, well, it's going to require more design time attention. So you as a developer now, you've got to introduce into your workflow that upfront intention to um, create something that has some cohesion, some, uh, some interface behind it so that your functions and your objects communicate in the way that you intend before you write that code because the typing will require that um, those type restrictions are met, those constraints. And then some of the pros with types is that there's less need to remember syntax uh, because types provide information about your code. It allows other code to read your code. So this is what they mean when they talk about tooling. Things like your code editor or um, an IDE can actually scan and interpret what you are writing because it can recognize the pattern of a type declaration. And by doing that, it can facilitate some of the coding you're doing. So if you design an object uh, in JavaScript and you are using that, uh, consuming some method of that object in another file, uh, your code editor can, can help you find that method name, right? So it can speed things up actually um, because you don't have to remember the exact method name that you used in that other file. Uh, another major pro is that errors are going to be detected when you're writing or building your application. Um, and this is, this is big because, number one, it gives you a bit of confidence as a developer that what you ship is high quality, but uh, also it avoids the, the thing we don't want, which is that our users would uncover an error, right, rather than us. And then another major pro to using something like TypeScript is that it abstracts away some of the latest ECMAScript standards. So TypeScript is evolving as the ECMAScript standards are released. And that may be done on an annual basis now. Not certain about that, but we, there may actually be uh, a new version of ECMAScript beyond ECMAScript 6 that's been published. And um, TypeScript will allow us to use some of those standards uh, because it it's updated, it's being built and maintained to transpile those features into something that browsers can interpret. So I tried to think of a good um, analogy or metaphor for what it's like to code with types. And I, I think of it a little bit like punctuation. So let's say we have this text here that says, hello, Sammy will be attending the conference later. Okay, so we read that and we understand that uh, this Sammy is gonna be at the conference later. But if we add some spacing and punctuation to that, it can really change the, the meaning, right? So, hello, Sammy will be attending the conference later. All right, well, that's, that's telling us maybe what we initially interpreted from the first statement. But if we break that up, it's the same text, really, but we've got, hello, Sam, I will be attending the conference later. And this is an entirely different person. So the type, the type kind of like the punctuation where it, it really conveys a greater depth of meaning about the intent behind your sentence in this case or your code in the TypeScript case. So as I mentioned, the TypeScript helps ensure that the code you intend 
matches the code that you ship. If we're convinced that we want to use TypeScript, where do we start? Well, there's actually a really good website at typescriptlang.org. Uh, it's very helpful. It has a playground, I believe, in it where you can experiment with TypeScript. It will show you um, how your TypeScript will be transpiled into JavaScript equivalent. Um, you can integrate TypeScript very easily uh, by installing it with NPM. Certainly, we're used to using NPM to install many packages. And then you can also set it up to do automated builds pretty easily. How TypeScript works is that it simply takes JavaScript-like code written with TypeScript features and functionalities, and it compiles them into JavaScript files. So TypeScript is largely the compiler that we see at the center of this drawing. And then it has an optional TS config file to tweak how the output is combined, perhaps, or what standard you want to transpile to. Uh, you can actually configure TypeScript to transpile to um, ES6, if you like. The nice thing about TypeScript is that it's very flexible, meaning that it can be used as little or as much as your, you or your team finds useful. And this is great if you're trying to learn because you realize uh, we can start. We don't have to learn or know a whole bunch before we just start to use it, right? Hey, Danny, your, your audio is cutting out. OK. Can you hear me OK now? Hey, you're hey, on my end. OK. Your audio is cutting out. Can you go back a minute? Where do I need to go back? Uh, a yeah, I can hear you now, but we missed the last minute or two. Really? OK. <clears throat> Where was I? Was I which slide? Which slide should I start over at? Bonnie? At the beginning <laughs> of the uh, backflip slide. OK. OK, so the nice thing about TypeScript is that The one it's, where the guy was doing the backflip. Yeah, I'm there now. Can you see and it OK, Joshua? TypeScript is flexible. Joshua, can you see the, the yes, backflip? TypeScript. TypeScript is flexible. OK. Bonnie, can you see it? Yep. OK. So TypeScript is flexible, which is nice because it helps us get started. Um, we can use it as little or as much as we want. Um, and we can layer in more complexity the more familiar we get with the, the framework. So in its, or in the, the, the tool. So in its simplest form, uh, using TypeScript is simply writing star.ts files and adding some simple type declarations to your source code. Uh, then you can also invent your own type definitions to help both you or team members remain consistent as they build functions that consume objects of those types. Um, then you can also begin using some of the ECMAScript 6 standard features like classes and modules. Um, Josh, then, do you, does he sound to you like he sounds to me? No, he seems uh, clear on my end. Maybe it's just my connection. Go ahead, Denny. Sorry, I thought you were having okay. audio problems, but I think it's me. OK. All right. So and so we, anyway, it's flexible, and we can introduce more complex software engineering concepts like generics um, as we see fit. And generics actually come in pretty handy for some of Angular's features. So those will become useful. But the nice thing is that you don't have to start there with TypeScript. It's also widespread, um, there's widespread support and adoption for TypeScript. Uh, this is a clipping from the TypeScript Lang website, and they have all these nice links here to show you exactly how to get started with TypeScript in the code editor or IDE that you're already using. So this is really helpful. Uh, there's not a lot of investment in time just to get started using TypeScript. So let's look at some types. So if we look at just some basic types, 
um, we have a couple of functions here related to shipping info. And this is written in just standard JavaScript. So as you or another developer is writing this code, you, you may not know exactly what type of data is returned from that ship weight function. But if we add in some type definitions, it becomes real clear. And if someone tries to use that ship weight function and they're not expecting or assigning the result to a number, then they'll be warned and flagged. We can also declare variable types and extend them into arrays like these two here. We have a user who has a name, a string Bob, and uh, an array of strings, Bob and Lizzie. And from what I understand, TypeScript also can do some implicit typing. So if you do an initialization like this here and you eliminate the, the explicit type declaration, it will automatically determine that uh, it's a string value and it'll warn somebody if they're trying to assign a number to that user value in the future. Now there's one advanced concept in TypeScript that's pretty key um, and it's interfaces. And I say advanced because interfaces are a staple of backend object-oriented programming but it, they take a while to get your head around a bit. They describe them as a contract. And in a typical backend application, it's a contract for the methods that are available through a certain channel, through a certain object. So as long as some class or object implements those methods, so it tells a consumer how to output some image or output some text. As long as that backend uh, object implements that method, then it is uh, considered to be a valid implementation of an interface. So the analogy I've got pictured here is kind of like a, a camera and its lenses. So imagine you have a, a camera and you've got these varying uh, lenses that you need to connect to that. Well, the interface, the contract that all the lenses abide by is they have the same interface, the same connection size and structure from camera to end, end of the lens uh, to make sure that they can all attach to the same camera. So that's kind of like the contract that uh, is between the lens manufacturer, the implementation of that lens, if you will, and the camera itself. Uh, now in TypeScript, interfaces become key not so much for the methods of objects that they provide, but, uh, but rather for the object properties that they are uh, contractually describing. So you'll use interfaces to define custom types. So we that would look like this. If you have a, a user object in your system, has a first name and a last name, you would describe that in this way it, with TypeScript. You use this keyword interface and you use a JSON structure here to describe the types of each of the properties within that interface. Now, the nice thing about this is that this doesn't mean a user can't have more properties. He could also have an email address. It just means that this specific user interface, anything that requires these two, um, must be provided with an object that offers these at a minimum. So we can see here we've got a user that we has a couple of properties and then we've defined a department with a name, a code and a head count. And then we can actually compose those into uh, a greater, more, uh, more object of more depth called an employee, which would consist of a user and maybe a department assignment. Now type definitions like the ones we just saw uh, come in these type definition files if they're so you'll be writing them for your own applications but there's also many from third-party libraries and packages that we'll need access to as we consume and use those tools 
uh, and frameworks in our own code. So type definition files provide a bundle of all the custom types for some tool or some namespace. So there might be a, a jQuery type definition file. So if you're using jQuery in your application, you would want to include that type definition file in your project. And as you type out and make use of jQuery's methods, you'll get some help from your code editor on uh, what methods it, it provides for you. Uh, Can I jump you, in there? Sure. Make a comment real quick? I was yes. actually really happy about this because when I first started doing TypeScript, we didn't, the, the, I don't think that existed, or if it did, I didn't know about it. And so when all of these definitely typed, you know, types started popping up for all this stuff that we've been using, like jQuery, for me, that was pretty exciting because we started seeing more and more coverage of, hey, you can download types for this or types for that. And all these tools that we were already using anyway just made it super easy to jump into that. That was something that I was pretty excited about. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so you can go, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I don't think we had that when we first started with TypeScript, or at least I didn't know about it. So, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Um, yeah, those, so night people have been uh, developing these, re these, these uh, files, these type definition files, and putting them in this definitely type.org repository, and that's why they're available. So you can actually go to this definitely type.org website and look for type definition files for third party tools or frameworks that you're using. And the way you install those types is very easy as well. From NPM again, you just have this app types to reach that repository. And like in this case, it's a, the node types, but you might have a NPR, NPM install at types slash Angular, and you would get your Angular type definition file. And then to include those files in your source code, you use these, these uh, kind of, I don't want to call them import statements. They're these kind of odd looking reference statements. These are unique to TypeScript. So we'll take a look at this in a little bit in our demo, but you may see things like this that point to a specific type definition file so that the source code beneath it can access the definitions within that file. Here's some of the type definition files that we use for AngularJS. So these are split up similar to the way that the AngularJS library itself has been modularized into things like the resource, the router, um, sanitize, animate. So to access all of these, we'd just be doing npm install at types slash, and then usually the prefix here, angular-resource. So now let's take a look at TypeScript a little bit. Let me uh, load up some uh, items here and show you around. Definitely, like when when my team switched to TypeScript, there was a, like a big learning curve. That's like now I have to write more code to get exactly the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But you learn in the long run. You actually get become more proficient of a programmer when you are using types and return types efficiently because like you're using those throughout your application that you're able to refactor things 10 times faster. You're able to actually consume someone else's API 10 times faster. So there's that learning curve, but it's way worth it down uh, at the end of the road. Yeah, thanks for that. Joshua, I, that I felt like I was kind of I kind of like had an attitude about the, the strict types and then when I first started doing it I was like I don't really like that <laughs> don't tell me what to do but once I got started I mean it really makes your code more uh, stable and and more you know tight and and it's good it's it's better code but I just had to kind of get get used to it for a little bit it was like more rules I had to follow but it's good rules and Brocky joined us all right Welcome. Yeah, I was hoping Rocky would be able to join us. I did. Hi. Yay. Hello. Am I not allowed to have my video on? Everybody's kind well, of just no, because he, he's. Uh, I think he's presenting. So we have. We, if you want, Denny, we can uh, stop presenting just just so we can see Mike's beautiful face. But you don't have your sunglasses on, Mike. Yeah, I'll do stop sharing. Sunglasses. You looked so cool this morning with those sunglasses on. That was like 
You were like, I got three pairs. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's just like that gift where they're just putting them all on and then on the hat too. I've had this pair since 1999. Hey, that's a pretty cool pair. They're scratched all up, but we just derailed poor Denny's presentation. Sorry, Denny. That, that, that's what I do. It's okay. <laughs> hey, I said I was here to derail Denny every chance I get. Okay, so uh, I'll take care of that. Mike, we're really glad that you got here because Denny's fixing to start talking about the CLI, so your ears will probably burn in. Uh, and but we're gonna finish the TypeScript section first, and then and then we'll uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So I'm glad you're here. I love me some TypeScript. Sorry, Sorry Denny. Go ahead. We'll be quiet. We'll behave. Okay, I'm working on it here. <laughs> okay. So all right. So I'm not presenting, right? Correct. Okay. Let me pull this up. Hey, Denny. Yeah. Before you jump back into that, we had a question. Richard Brown in chat. We haven't seen him in a while. So hello, Richard. So prototyping in interpreted non-static type check dev environments like old school JS was touted by some as faster because you'd skip the pesky compile step, drink your Red Bull and hack. Does life in TypeScript dev completely lose all that rapid prototyping advantage? He says faster because if you create a monster faster by skipping static type checks and compiling, then you have to slow down and debug the thing later, which I totally agree with. That's what I went through too. So the question was, does life in TypeScript dev completely lose all that rapid prototyping advantage? I think it's, I mean, I to me, I, I, I have been known, especially if I'm trying to figure out something new, I have been told, known to use that type any, which is totally cheating. Um, but I really try not to do that because now that I've wrapped my head around types, the, the strict types and, and having that structured uh, implementation, uh, the interface, I think it's better. Would you guys agree that it's better with the with the strict interface? I'm a big fan. Um, however, if, if you really want to tighten the wrenches, you through your uh, configuration for TypeScript, you can basically say, don't allow any for anything. Oh, now let's not... Let's not go that far. <laughs> you can go real far. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for that. And I would it's say, like, yeah. And I would say, like, from now, like, hacking on TypeScript, I'm like, as fast or faster than like just hacking up a quick uh, something to prototype in JavaScript. Yeah, yeah. It it becomes like like uh, just second nature to do your types. Like you'll you'll start doing it without even thinking about it. Yeah, and it really is a good practice. You're going to live code for us, Denny? I'm trying here. Give me a second. So Joshua, you were saying your team just started with uh, TypeScript not that long ago. So you guys were trying to upgrade. You were telling us before the call you guys were trying to upgrade from Angular JS just by using ES6, and you had decided not to use TypeScript at that time. And then yeah. later you you changed your mind. What made you change your mind? Um, it was more so like we had more and more developers that were switching over to um, the Angular 2 project, and then they would Google how to do this in Angular 2. And then all the examples would be in TypeScript, but you can't exactly do everything in like in the demos you see in TypeScript in the ES6 version of Angular. Like there were right. some um, annotations and all of that that you had to like do a lot of configuration just to be able to use. Uh, and then that coupled with uh, not be able to refactor as efficiently as we wanted to, like we kind of just made the switch where we switched it to TypeScript, which 
our TypeScript config is very uh, open right now. Like we allow any, uh, just because we're in that transition of like enforcing types on things. We're kind of just enforcing them when we do our, our merge requests into our code base rather than like, like turning any off and, and, and things like that. So uh, it was really easy to go from ES6 to TypeScript because we just did a, like a regex to rename all the .js to .ts and had to fix a few things and then it sort of everything played out, which was nice. Yeah, I think it, it's a good point. There, there definitely is a void, I think, because there's so much out there about AngularJS. There's all this, uh, you know, blog posts and Stack Overflow, and, and there's a lot of community discussion out there. And then when you switch over to Angular, to the newer Angular, there's so much, uh, and, and even better, there's a, a lot of very thorough uh, video tutorials and all kinds of, there's just, just this wealth of tutorials and information and resources. But there's that little, like, right, because I was trying to, I was working on a project a while back where it, it was, uh, it was Angular JS, but we were trying to bring it up to the most modern version of Angular JS, and so I was trying to do, like you said, like you know the the um, the newest stuff in without going to Angular, right? Was was I was trying to do components um, and using Webpack for bundle loading, and it was kind of a mess because it was hard to find. Like I'm I'm trying to search this little narrow window uh, of just the right time because every article I found was either too early or too old or, you know, too recent or too old. And so it was hard to, to kind of, um, there's a term. Yeah. And like we, we all are, we have a really big Angular 1 application. We were writing ES6 for that. So we thought like, oh, the transition to Angular 2 would be easy. We'll keep it ES6. But it ended up kind of just hurting us in the long run because we weren't able to start our Angular 2 application in TypeScript and have typing and interfaces for everything. So if we did that from the start, I think we would have like a really rich interface for our data model that we have and, and all of that kind of stuff, which would help new developers coming into our corporation of like understanding our application, right? Because they would have the the contracts with the interface to like they know how this component and this service should work. Um, right now we just have like a whole bunch of innings just scattered throughout our project. Yeah, I did too when I first came over to TypeScript, but it's, you get it as you, as you go on and clean it up. Okay, guys, I'm ready to get going. Thanks for your patience. Uh, trying to sift through several scripts here on my computer. So anyway, um, what we want to look at here is this example application from AngularJS's website where we can, uh, edit and we can add projects and we can do a search. So this is on the homepage for angularjs.org website. And what we want to think about is, okay, well, how do we start to incorporate TypeScript into this? So first we'd have to install TypeScript. I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to show you the command. You install TypeScript with NPM, install it globally, and it would be just like that. Uh, we can go ahead and check the version that I have installed here just to confirm. Two dot five dot two. So our source code looks like this. We have just a uh, single style sheet here. We have some scripts that we depend on like angular and its router resource and angular or actually firebase a couple of scripts related to that and we've got several views here a top level index and that's just our container for hosting the application we have this list that you see over here at the right and then we have a detail that's used for both editing and creating new projects the whole project is entirely in its own single file um, and it's all JavaScript at this point. So let's think about what we could do to tweak this. Let's rename this file to TS, which would make it a TypeScript file. So that alone didn't change anything except that now we have these red warning messages here. And that's TypeScript telling us, hey, I'm not sure what this Angular is. 
Now, the interesting thing is we can still compile this file with the TypeScript compiler. Uh, but I just want to show you. It will report this error. So we've got two errors, right? The Firebase and the Angular. But it doesn't prevent us from using the output file, right? So this, it output this file still. And look, it looks pretty darn similar to what we already had. And I believe if we refresh this, we'll see that this still functions because it simply output what we had there before. So to get these squigglies to disappear, let's install our type files, type definition files. So we're using Firebase here and Angular. So I'm going to do an npm install at types uh, Angular. I'm just going to take Angular for now. You see it installs it as a node package. And this warning, I would expect to uh, disappear here shortly. May need to uh, you need to save for it to update. Oh, actually, uh, it won't disappear because I haven't declared a reference yet to that file. So remember, we have to tell this file where to find that type definition file that we just imported. So I'm going to copy and paste that from my desktop. So here we see this reference path to the Angular type definition file that I just installed. And you can see that the red squiggly line has disappeared. Now, if we refresh this, it should work. So it does still work. There's actually another way to reference this, this particular type definition file. And it'd be a lot easier, and it would be to use an import statement. So if we want to import um, everything as Angular from the Angular type definition, this can find this. This is a little bit more automated way of finding that uh, type definition file, which is buried in this node modules package. It's a lot cleaner. And this is implemented as a namespace, which is why we have this just import everything from there as kind of a unit that can refer that we can refer to by this name. So now if we save this and we compile and rerun, we'll see that there's no error regarding Angular any longer, just the Firebase. But if we try to refresh this in the browser, nothing's going to happen. And there's a reason for that. That is, we used this import statement. and because of that, the compiler is creating an ECMAScript 6 module. And the browser can't support that, as we talked about earlier. So if we look at the output here that TypeScript created, last time we transpiled it, we'll see here, it added in some of this additional ES6 information. And the browser doesn't know how to understand that. So um, let's go ahead and put in our uh, Firebase reference. And out of installed Firebase, let me install that as well. Are you doing that as well with the import statement? I was going crazy because you put in that reference path, and then I was about to say there's an easier way, and then all of a sudden you said, but there's an easier way. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we've installed that. Um, so get this to recognize it.
So, okay, so our red lines have disappeared. So now TypeScript has helped us with our Firebase reference and Angular reference. And next we wanna look at how would we add or introduce our own type. So let's say we want to replace this FB URL with some constant. Um, we could use a ES6 convention to define it as a constant string. Pull this out and we've added this string type annotation. Now we can compile this and we expect it should run. So no errors because it recognized all of our types. And our application runs. So next we we'll want to look at this TS config. So right now we're manually compiling each file. And as we add files, of course, that's not very practical. So we add in the TypeScript config file, which is simply named TS, TS config. JSON. And I'm just going to copy and paste some pretty standard code in here. But notice there's these compiler options here. And this tells us what target. This is which level of the ECMAScript we want to compile to. Um, so we want to check we want to select ES5 in this case because we know our browser supports that. And then there's also this out directory. This is where the output files will be sent to. So now we can just run TSC. It will detect that that TS config file is present and use it to compile all of, all of the files. I don't think you saved the file, the TS config. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I was baffled. Thank you. OK, so now we can look. And it added this built folder here. And we can see here it generated um, project.js and project list.js, which, of course, is just simply a copy of the original file, because we never touched that. And let me uh, erase this copy as well. We see we have uh, project ts down here as a source file. Project list.js is kind of a source file. And it will uh, output both of these in JavaScript form to the built output folder. Now, that's still not going to work directly in a browser because, or actually, I yeah, take that back. This, this will as long as we adjust our paths in our index file. So we've. We've placed these two output files in our built folder. So we simply have to add this prefix. Refresh and must be missing something. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thanks. So, and it loads just fine. So we've added a couple types. We've seen how the TypeScript compiler works on a file by file basis. And we've seen how to add a config file to direct all of the output files to a single location. So I just want to show how some of this code might look um, if we move it all to TypeScript, right? So. Um, Denny, can we try one thing first? Sure. Can you open up the TS config file? Yes. And are you, after inside the compiler options, if you could add uh, a property called type roots, capital R, mm -hmm. and then set that equal to an array mm -hmm. uh, with a value of um, double quote, or yeah, put a proper yeah, string in there, dot slash node modules. Mm -hmm. slash at types okay and then try and get rid of the reference 
Okay. The references. Yep. So basically, specify the the types are defined there. That's the root where you can find the types. So you pr shouldn't have to reference those within here. Okay. Are you sure? You didn't just make that up, did you, Mike? I make everything up. <laughs> And then running TSC, hopefully it should f still find those uh, types. Yeah, that's great. That's cool. So th that couldn't be done on a file by file basis, but once we introduce the TS config, that's a a powerful a powerful uh, helper. Then looks like correct. It seems to work. Yeah, thanks for showing that. That's great. We should keep this guy around. Yeah. Great. So we look at. Um, just a version of this where all of the files had been converted to TypeScript and we compile them. So I just want to show you we could we can see this built folder here will reflect the complexity of whatever folder structure you have in place and it moves everything into that file path for you. And then um, if we want to start using TypeScript classes, we can get even more sophisticated. We look at the source code here. We have a maybe an app TS file where we um, consolidate all of our configuration and, and registration of all of our components. We do, maybe we do manual bootstrapping and we can start to use things like these import statements. Hey, Mike, can we remove things like this as well uh, for the Angular typing if we have that TS config option set? Um, where you're using Angular, probably. Cool. Uh, because I believe the type definition for Angular JS mm -hmm. is specifies it as a global, and since the types reference there, you should be good. Okay, great, thanks. You can try and comment it out and see. Yeah, it'll be the same. Great. Yeah, that's right. Do it. Get it out of there. <laughs> Just cut it. Yeah. See if it works. <laughs> Looks like it's complaining here, but I don't have it in the configuration yet, do I? The type defs? No. What was the? the it's there, the type roots. Type roots, thanks. It's there on line seven. Oh, it is. Okay, great. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So, anyway. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on, if, unless anyone has any other questions about this classes version. This was really just to show maybe a more realistic place from which we are going to be moving Angular JS code into Angular. So we'll probably have um, our own uh, model definitions at that point with these custom type definitions. We will have. Uh, classes instead of functions like at a project controller and so we can start to evolve our plain javascript code by just incorporating javas or incorporating typescript into our project So in summary, TypeScript 
it abstracts away some of those ECMAScript standards so we can start to use those standards in our development today without worrying that uh, the browsers out there don't support those standards. It's a build time tool and it's not a run, it's not useful or used in the runtime environment at all. So all of its work is done as you're developing and as you are building your project for deployment. So all of the source code you create in TypeScript is converted into JavaScript that runs in the browser. It's very flexible and it's easy to get started. And as you just saw, you can use as little or as much of it as you like to get your feet wet and then evolve as you learn some more sophisticated techniques. And the other thing about TypeScript is it supports JavaScript scaling because it allows you to break up all your files um, or your code into more organized files. And use the fact that it introduces some of these um, back-end coding standards, some of these proven software engineering design concepts that scale uh, really helps us from a JavaScript perspective uh, develop in these growing teams and develop these growing front-end parts of our applications. And lastly, I just think that TypeScript can be thought of as a tool that helps ensure that the code that we intend matches the code that we ship. So I want to talk yeah, a little. If, yeah, go ahead. If I can interject one thing, there's depending on what your backend is, like if it's C sharp or Java, there's tools to automatically generate uh, like Angular JS or Angular services and interfaces for TypeScript. Um, so when you're using and consuming those services on your front end, you could adhere to the same types that your backend has. So that's pretty cool that people are creating tooling like that to automatically generate interfaces for us. Yeah, that's I'm all great. about tools that create code for you. <laughs> <clears throat> no, that's great. Do you know the name of any of those offhand? Um, they're not like specific names. I think it's Typewriter for C Sharp, and it's like a plugin for like uh, Visual Studio. And then there's a couple things like TypeScript Generator. I think is the one for um, Java. So basically, it takes your the Java JSON classes. And if it's like set up with like Spring, where you have the annotations on the back end too, to kind of annotate your model, it'll automatically make interfaces for you um, that you can just plug into your front end. That sounds great. <clears throat> okay, so next I want to talk briefly about the new way we're developing front end apps. So when we look at maybe 10 years ago or so, the original path to creating a front end app was just to write some HTML to provide the structure, uh, the way it's displayed, to adjust the appearance using CSS and to add behavior using JavaScript. And then of course we as developers were responsible for ensuring we sequenced the inclusion of those scripts properly to make sure that dependencies were met. But if we look at developing front-end apps today, there's a, a ton of, of more things involved. We start with our package managers, uh, and those allow us to pull in frameworks and libraries that we want to use to to speed things up, right, and to not reinvent the wheel. Uh, then we have our preprocessors like SAS for our CSS, and Babel, which is another transpiler. Um, does some of the some of the work that TypeScript does. Then we have our task runners that automate some of the common things that are really tedious that um, we have to do over and over again as developers just to test out new features or just to make sure things are still running. Things like uglifying and moving source code around and making sure that uh, it gets minified before we ship it. And then lastly, we have our module bundlers. And uh, those are the things that are allowing us now to avoid the, the name conflicts that were uh, so common years ago when everything was just kind of dumped into the global namespace. Um, and the nice thing about these module build bundlers is they are now um, taking the responsibility of handling the dependency management. So we, we as developers, can uh, start to worry less about um, <laughs> sequencing, certainly sequencing of, of tags, but we, need to, we can worry a little bit less about ensuring that dependencies are met as long as we are using the proper API 
uh, to describe those dependencies in code. And I want to take a minute to talk a little bit about Webpack because I think it's a very uh, special module bundler. Um, it's one that I'm pretty green on. So I'm, I'm kind of curious if the panel has any thoughts about Webpack because when I look at it, when I've used it, it seems like it's not just a module bundler, but rather it seems it does some of the work like uglifying and minifying um, along with module bundling. So I'm a little confused by the way that it describes itself as simply a module bundler, but I feel like it's been able to replace a lot of the work that we saw on the previous slide. So I'm curious if anybody on the panel has thoughts about that or experience with Webpack they'd like to share. We were supposed to have Joshua Weens on tonight and he wasn't able to join us. Um, and I, I should have invited Sean Larkin because he's the super nicest guy with the exception of Brocky, who's also the nicest guy. Um, but I should have had him on too. But uh, Brocky, I know, I, and I've used Webpack. I wouldn't call myself an expert with Webpack, but I know, uh, Mike, you must have quite a bit of experience with it because it's integrated into CLI, built right in. I have some experience with Webpack. Um, to say it's a module bundler is correct. Um, what it does is there's all different types of um, transforms and processors that will allow you to integrate into the Webpack pipeline. Uh, loaders for the pre-processing of SAS like you have there in the slide um, is great. Um, but essentially what it does is it turns those other types of files, SAS and JavaScript, well, JavaScript uh, is done by default, uh, but like CSS and HTML, and it basically turns them into JavaScript modules. So that's what the loaders do. We'll convert other formats into JavaScript, essentially, okay. and therefore it's just bundling those modules because they're then JavaScript. Okay, so it's the loaders that do some of that additional work and then pass it to Webpack, but Webpack is providing that interface to allow those loaders to hook into them that that's my understanding mm -hmm. yeah like but it, it's like basic nature webpack is just like like mike said it takes all of the source code whether it be like styles or uh, html or javascript and makes modules out of them and then it loads those javascript modules in in the browser and then things like minifying and uglifying there's a rich plug-in architecture and then there's uh, just like we see in Angular, like lifecycle hooks, uh, where co components are loaded or destroyed, there's those same hooks into Webpack. So as Webpack goes over a JavaScript file and then outputs it, you can have a plugin that will also minify and uglify its output. Uh, so it kind of just ties into all of the different build um, plugins that Webpack offers, and you can kind of do um, whatever you want like by it just simply installing a plugin. Hmm. If I can put in my two cents about Webpack, I didn't originally, I didn't pay any attention to Webpack and uh, someone that I was working on a project with introduced Webpack into our project um, after the project was already kind of big. He, he went and, uh, and, and installed Webpack and got it all working. And actually, we, I had a lot of problems in the beginning because every time I turned around, it seemed like there was a new bug that popped up and I blamed Webpack for everything. But to be honest, once I got used to using it, I really would not want to go back because all the, just all the script files in the HTML, I think, was like the biggest thing. It's like this is a breath of fresh air. And once you get used to doing it without that, it's just, it just makes it so much easier. And it, you get used to it. You don't want to go back to not using Webpack. But that original a lot easier. Thing, it becomes a lot easier if you just stop blaming Webpack and just directly blame Sean Larkin. <laughs> well, no, actually, because now it comes with the CLI, so I don't have to blame Webpack <laughs> anymore. Now I can blame the CLI, so <laughs> it's even better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, th thanks, guys. I appreciate the input there. Um, that's That helps clarify for me. So next, we want to look at that uh, very important development tool for Angular development, the Angular CLI. Um, and it's available, hey. yeah, it's available at this address, cli.angular.io. It's very easy to get started with. Um, it's a command line interface for Angular development. 
So it's a tool that helps simplify these common tasks of just creating your project, generating the components and elements of your projects like services and pipes and components. Um, and then it also ensures that we are meeting the latest style guide recommendations because anything it's generating is, um, I believe, updated, kept up to date with whatever those loaded, latest style guide uh, guidelines are. So in AngularJS, of course, if we want to create new directives or new components, we have to write them all, of, all ourselves and we have to use maybe the templates from old code. But here with the Angular CLI, we can uh, use a command line to generate a nice set of files for each new piece as we're building. Nice thing is it's also integrated into many IDEs. I know I've seen this in my Eclipse at work. Um, there are likely others, probably WebStorm, I would guess. Um, so it's already available there. Um, the additional power it has is it is paired with Webpack now to streamline that build process, which, which means you're going to get tree shaking automatically when you're using the CLI. Uh, tree shaking is essentially eliminating the code that your code is not using. So that if you have source code that is unused by any of your other source code, uh, the tree shaking process will ensure that that code that's unused does not even make it into the final bundle. So it won't even be part of your build. So it'll never be deployed and there's no waste. And then it also allows you to set up multiple environment build configurations. I haven't played with this at all yet, but uh, I see the benefits. You could pre-configure your testing environments, your staging environments, uh, and your production environments with these configurations and um, from one project easily build whichever version you are working on. So how do we start using the CLI? Well, we simply run an NPM install uh, globally for the Angular slash CLI package. Then we can create a new project with the ng new command. And we can start to develop and see what that looks like by running this ng serve command. The local server that it serves on is localhost port 4200. So let's demonstrate, take a little look at that. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves while I get set up here. I have to tell you guys about the first time that I used the Angular CLI. Well, first of all, I have to back up a little bit and say when I heard that there was going to be an Angular CLI, I was super excited because I thought that just the concept of that was very cool, but I really did not understand how cool. I mean, I, I liked the idea. But the first time that I was like, hey, I'm going to use this CLI, I'm going to learn it. So I set aside an afternoon to learn the CLI and really check it out. And I did the NPM install. And then I did my little uh, ng new and I fired it up and it, it and that was it. Like, I was like, wow, I still have like four hours left over to go see a movie. I just learned that. I mean, it was so it, it was much easier than I thought it would be. And it just it works very well. Even when it first came out, I have to. Uh, I have to tip my hat to Mike Brocky and the team because it was really, there wasn't a lot of pain and, you know, Hey, this is brand new. Be patient with them. I mean, it came out and it worked like consistently and it was beautiful. So uh, yeah, I, I think that was a really good effort by the CLI team. And that was before we knew how cool Mike was like, just for that. You had us at CLI, Mike. I, when, I, when I first got involved, I was like, Hey, this tool looks like it could be really cool. Too bad it doesn't work. Maybe I'll start working on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a well, little bit different uh, right. first experience. I remember I when you did your your talk at at, at uh, NGConf and you announced it, and the whole room started yelling. It was so cool. It's <laughs> a moment. Oh. Yeah, I know it, it helps the uh, training that we do through Oasis Digital. Like it helps everyone in the class like get bootstrapped up with a new application and then we can just go straight into the content, which is pretty amazing. Now one thing I will say is, and, and this is just personal preference for me, uh, when I'm learning something new, 
uh, like learning, you know, Angular or learning NGRX or anything like that. I, I really don't like to use the automated tools. And there are other tools out there that will generate code for you. But what I like to do is like go through, especially like the Tour of Heroes is a really good tutorial. You go through um, the Angular code, the new Angular code, and you really do step by step and build each file by yourself. Once you understand all that and you feel comfortable with it, then you use the the CLI and it just saves you so much time. So for me, the first time I'm going through something brand new and trying to wrap my head around it, I like to write it all out by hand and then, but after that, I don't, I don't ever want to do that ever again. So this is girl, like I write all this code and you know, my boss thinks I'm working really hard and mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing, the CLI. And uh, just like Rob Helgeson said in, in the chat, like, there's really cool things coming down the pipeline, like schematics with the the CLI. So you can like have set like different uh, structures, like when you say generate component and app and all of that kind of stuff, which we're trying to kind of build right now for our our team because we do some things that don't necessarily confine to the the style guide. So when we generate components, we find ourselves always like modifying the spec file and a couple of other things. So we're really looking forward to schematics to like kind of fix that gap for us. Well, it's that feature is not coming soon. Um, it is there, right? Yeah, it is there. For you. Yeah, I, yes. I, I implemented that. Um, somebody else wrote the schematics library. I uh, integrated it with the CLI. So that's in there and now. And I'm giving a talk about that very topic of creating your own schematics at Angular Mix in about a month. Yeah. Oh, perfect. I'll have to make sure to tune into that one because and I'm our writing our own schematics. Chat is going to be there. We're all going to be. I'm going to be there. Are you, you going to heckle me? You, well, why do you think I'm going? <laughs> <laughs> I love being heckled. Yeah. yeah, that's my favorite part. Yeah, and Rob, uh, the the guy in the chat, who's who's actually really cool, and he's uh, one of our uh, one of our regulars. We pull him into the panel when we get a chance. He's going to be there at Angular Mix too. But I don't know. He hasn't he he hasn't gotten to know us well enough to uh, to really. He's still pretty well behaved at this point. <laughs> Just you wait. We're going to have to do some karaoke. I'm hoping. I don't know if uh, Jeff Welpley is going to be there, but Jeff Welpley and Mike Brocky are a pretty good pair. For karaoke night which is ironic because i can't sing to save my life <laughs> i don't know you did sing at ng Tom. sort of <laughs> if you want to call it that is there a video no no oh yes there is yes oh that I oh that vi oh that video no <laughs> No, not good. <laughs> How's it going, Denny? It looks, it looks like uh, you got something going on there. Yes. Uh, so all I've done so far is create my new project by just running this simple command from the Angular CLI, ng new demo. So the name of my project is just demo. And it has gone ahead and installed and done all the work. So let's take a look here at what it created. Um, we have our node modules. We have an end-to-end -end testing folder already. We have all of our source code here with uh, quite a few configuration files. We'll take a look at those. But if we look at the app section here, we, we see we've got an app module and we've got an app component. And let's go ahead and see what this application looks like by running the ng serve command. Change directory. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of Bonnie. Yeah. So this is going to build and then uh, set up a web server for the application. I feel like we should have a drum roll here. This was the cool thing. The first time I did this, I, I basically I just wanted to see if it worked because I didn't know these guys or if they knew what they were talking about. So I just did ng new, change directory, ng serve, and I didn't touch anything. And I was like, is this for real? And sure enough, I got that ng live development server. And I was like, whoa. 
That was awesome. I was skeptical okay. at first, but it worked. <laughs> so this is what the default application looks like. So we know that uh, everything's been set up properly by running that. And so now let's take a look at uh, some of these other files here that have been created. We have uh, an environments folder that I mentioned earlier where you set up your different configurations for different environments. We have uh, an assets folder where we can put static assets like images. I've got a couple of images here or um, other files that you need to pull into your application that aren't necessarily source code. Um, then we have the main TS file, which uh, is kind of the launching point for our application. This will be the main uh, bundle or the center point of the main bundle that's created by uh, Webpack during the build process. We've got a global style sheet, so we can add global styles here. Um, we have our index entry point, of course, what we see here over on the right. And this app root is the top level component for this application, this default application. And then we also see a tsconfig file down here. And this looks familiar from our TypeScript demo. We see that um, it has its own setup here. Uh, I have not needed to change any of these settings yet. And then we've also got this CLI configuration file, which is pretty handy as well. So in here, you're going to find a few things that I've found useful during upgrading. Um, the first is this assets uh, declaration or key. Here is where you can describe additional folders or files that are static assets that might be outside uh, that you need to pull in. So when I have had to upgrade some Angular JS files and they're still in their original form, I might point this to a folder with some of the views templates that are still at that old location before I update a component, for example. Um, another thing that I've used is this style. So we see here that global style sheet is referenced here, but I might have uh, another global style sheet that I just want to include it in its entirety. And I would just add that to this list here, uh, point to it. And just to be clear about that styles array, um, if you wanted to use uh, SAS or less, you can specify those files there and they will be pre-processed for you. Nice. And something else to I wanted to throw in, sorry, Denny, uh, the guys in the chat, Richard and Rob were talking about the compiling and transpiling and, and I didn't say anything. Because uh, to be honest, I forgot the, the, like how to automatically transpile. I've been using the CLI for a while, and so now once I, you know, anything that I do in the TypeScript file, I just save and it refreshes. It just does all that automatically, and I'm so spoiled that I even forgot how to do that because it just, it's just magic. I just <laughs> save it. I go back to the browser, and everything is updated. It's pretty beautiful. Yep. Um, then we also have this scripts here. These will be for any static JavaScript files that you need to pull in. I've also used this when experimenting with an upgrade. If I need to pull in the Angular framework from a local path, I might, uh, and by Angular, I mean uh, Angular JS framework. If I need to pull that in while I am doing an upgrade, um, I can actually point that point this to that file and it will ensure that it is pulled into the project. I don't have to add that a script tag to the index HTML or anything like that. And another thing I'm going to change here is this prefix. It was by default app and I'll show you a little bit later how that uh, applies. Some of the key files within the source folder, this app module, this is the main container uh, for all of the functionality of this current application. And what's key here is the bootstrap key, which points to the top level component of the app. That app component is implemented right here in this app component TypeScript file. It just has a title and there's also a template here. And this is the view that you're seeing here to the right. So let's go ahead and add in a component to the application.
So to add a component to through the Angular CLI, it's as easy as typing ng uh, generate component and then your component name. So in my case, I'm going to create a component called an upgrade panel. And I'm going to use this camel case here, and you'll see how this uh, is interpreted. So we look up here, and the CLI has automatically created a nice set of files for us to support this component. We already have a scaffolded component with its metadata and uh, decorator. We've got a uh, View, a view here, a simple view, and we've got a styles if we want to include those as well. So if we want to look at this selector then that was created, we can see that the prefix that we configured in the CLI's configuration file was applied here as we generate components. So this may be helpful in branding your components or making sure that the components that you have created for your business are distinguished from others, from other libraries that you're using. So if we want to see this panel, we could simply add it into another component template here. Another thing that's key that the CLI did for us automatically <clears throat> is that it added this component to the declarations array of the module. So this is pretty handy as well. And we can see over here on the right, it updated and refreshed already and shows us our template, our default template for that new component. I'm going to go ahead and make some adjustments to this particular component. And then I'm going to adjust the template to reflect this as well. So it changes. And I'm going to modify our main app component template, which is our top level component, to include this as well. I'll save that and we'll see um, if I've got everything here. <laughs> it's like not. You have the wrong prefix on that tag. Okay, thanks. Thank you. is what happens when you change the defaults. <laughs> <laughs> and when you live code, you're glutton for yeah, punishment, Denny. I know. OK, so we got this simple view here. We just upgrade the app and click the button. Uh, hey, hey. Hopefully, if it's that easy, right? So, um, so that's how we create a component. Um, I've got a little bit more. Do you want to continue on, Bonnie, or do you think um, we should wind down? Uh, it's 8 o'clock. Um, we have a couple people watching online. Uh, do you have a few more minutes, Mike and Joshua, or you guys, do you guys have a hard stop? Hey, I'm fine. Okay. Whatever. I think you should. Okay, I'll try. I'm going to try to whip through this pretty quickly. I'm going to try to incorporate um, an invoice demonstration app that's on um, the AngularJS website as well. When you read through their conceptual overview, it highlights this invoice app. And we're going to, it just consists of one component and a service. So let me um, just follow my notes here and, 
and talk through and what this. What is it that you want? What is it that you want to show us in this? Uh, just this, just the services. Issues. At this point, we've only seen how to implement a component, and we haven't seen how to inject a service or anything like that. So, um, yeah. So uh, another thing we can discuss is the shortcuts for generating a component. Instead of typing out generate or component, we can just type G and, for generate and C for component and then put the name of our new component. You can see that created this here. And if like the CLI has great documentation throughout, so if any time during the point where you're, you're curious what you can do with generate or what you can do with serve, you can just do dash dash help. Uh, and then you'll get a detailed implement, like example of what all the parameters you can pass in. Uh, so that'll kind of help you when you're learning the CLI as well. And I like it when it says uh, like this service has been created, but you still need to you still need to provide it in your module. You don't have it's to get that error. No, I like that. I like that because it tells you like if, you know here you need to do this. Yeah, but what I'm yeah, saying is that, you, is that you, I'm saying that you can provide it from the uh, when you generate it. Oh, I did not know that. You didn't tell me about that, Mike. <laughs> That's because you told me today that you wanted me to code or sit on your shoulder while you code. Yeah, like the Clippy. Well, you are kind of handy to have around. I mean, you just watch and go, oh, you missed a, a comma there. It's like, who wouldn't want that? It's because I can't type and I, have to call. I constantly remind myself of those things. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's, there's a whole... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just real quickly, I was going to talk to this uh, point here. In the example app, they use ng init directive on a tag to initialize these values, quantity and cost. And the nice thing is this lifecycle hook that's available in angular makes that a lot cleaner makes it a lot more sensible where you would place uh, initialization for variables go ahead i was just going to tie in some more of the documentation so if you're ever curious of like how you want to put material or that in the cli there's a whole bunch of stories uh in the wiki of the cli so you can jump into that and then immediately know how to include bootstrap or the cli or um, I think there's like 16 or 20 different stories on how to do advanced things with CLI. Uh, and then it being open source, so you can always like include a new story if you are like find like, oh yeah, this is how I had to do this to, in, to get this new thing in the CLI. So um, someone else won't have to have those troubles. No, although I might be missing a tag here. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> there we go. Okay. So this, anyway, this is what's on the website there. And I just want to show one more thing, which is the service. We'll add in a service to make this a little bit more complicated. So to generate a service with the Angular CLI, we can type out generate service and type the service name. Or we can also do the G space S and put our service name if we want to do a shortcut. So I'm going to add the currency converter. Before you do, you hit enter. Yes. Uh, do are you? Is that all? The only option you're going to put on there? Yes. Uh, hit space and then dash dash module. Okay. Space app dot module. What does that do? So nice. what that's going to do um, is it's going to provide this service in app.module. Yeah, that's handy. So that does what we, what I mentioned earlier was that it would add your new components automatically to your declarations for the module. But I was thinking, I know it doesn't do that for 
providers for services. So I think what Mike has shown us is how to do that for providers and services as well. Yes. And the reason why it doesn't is because there's different contextual meanings uh, dependent upon where you provide your service. So the CLI doesn't want to presume to know where you want to provide it. Mm -hmm. So it will, um, you can either specify it here, otherwise, as Bonnie pointed out, it'll give you a warning that says, hey, you've generated this service, but since it's not provided anywhere, you can't use it. But by doing this, you'll be able to uh, provide it. That's great. Mike, are there any other uh, options that you can think of off the top of your head that we can Not that I'm going to share. <laughs> <laughs> no. So sh sure enough, it, you. it did show up here, which is, which is nice. I did is, not know about that. Hey, Mike, is there a way to default that for your application? So if you know all your services are going to be in your app module, can you do that in like the dot angular CLI JSON? No. Uh, only because it's it would be contextual based off of where you are within the application as well. Gotcha. So it's not that you can't do it with the CLI. It's just really not a it's not a best practice because you could get yourself all because you because you can't you don't always want to put it there. So it's easier to be intentional about that. Yeah, it's better to be explicit about where you want it to go, whether or not you're doing it from the command line of specifying which module or generating it without and then providing it on your own later. And gotcha. our friend Rob yes. in the chat said there are tons of, uh, of little tricks like that in the docs. So definitely use that dash dash help on the, uh, on the ng command line and see all those little tricks because there's a lot. Also in, I use CLI all the time. If you look time. in uh, the wiki, they should all be documented there as well. Yeah, very good docs. Just replacing some of the templates with some of the new functionality. So, Mike, who's, whose idea, who came up with the CLI thing? Um, I don't know if you know them, but uh, I believe their name is not me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. I wasn't there at inception. Um, I know that Igor and a intern by the name of Rodi, uh, Haddad were the first two to have commits on the repo. Um, so I'm not sure. Can you tell us about like when they officially asked you to be on the official CLI team? Was that like a big day for you? It was, I probably was, like, still have that email flagged. Uh, they're starting <laughs> now. Um, that when was that? Um, I I just started contributing. I was talking to somebody about, hey, I wanted to give back and do something, and uh, and my buddy said, well, why not look into this project? And I did, and I was like, well, how do I get started? Do I send an email or what? And he's like, nah, there's an issue list. Go check, or pick an issue off the list and start working on it. Uh, okay, so that's what I did. And my first uh, PR was to delete code. <laughs> That's awesome. I, del I deleted the favicon because it was breaking tests. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> so uh, just a couple things to point out. This is working as I expected it. Um, I didn't mention this, but the, any service you create has this decorator function injectable on it. And that's Angular's way of marking this class for possible dependency injection. Uh, so that registers it with the system. doesn't register with the system. It makes it this class available for dependency injection. Now, in this case, we have this invoice component that does need that service. And this is the way we make sure it's injected into this component so that it can use it. So we simply put this private keyword. The private keyword in the constructor makes sure that it sets this up as a private property, a private member property in this class. Um, and then the dependency injection, of course, will recognize the class name and give you an instance of that under this name for use within the class. So something that's a little bit odd about that add injectable, 
the ad injectable doesn't necessarily mean that that service can be injected elsewhere. It basically is saying that, hey, now that I've got a decorator on me, go ahead and generate my metadata so that I know how to inject things into you. Hmm. So I believe if you were to take that off of this service, it would still work. Okay. Yeah, and then like, like uh, in Angular 5 and stuff like that, so if in that constructor, say you had like a string or something that's not going to be injected into it, if you had that add injectable on it, it would fail because since that's the static string that you're passing into it, you might be setting the service up in a different way. Uh, won't be actual, Angular won't know how to inject that. So with that add injectable flag, it'll error out. But without it, it would still work. Yeah, I still recommend leaving it, but just uh, yeah, point that it's not so much that I can or that the service that it's on can be injected somewhere else. It's that the metadata for it can is provide or generated so that things can be injected into it. Okay, interesting. Okay, well, thanks for that. I appreciate that. Okay, so what we learned, what we saw from the Angular CLI, it's a, it's really is a powerful tool uh, that can help us speed up development for Angular by automating those common tasks um, as we generate new components and services. Um, even just the development and seeing the results, you saw there how the application would automatically refresh as we were making changes. And then it abstracts away that complex build process part of which is the TypeScript compiling, right? So uh, we don't necessarily have to concern ourselves as much maybe with the TypeScript configuration as we, as we might when we have um, a manual instance or our own version of that compiler set up. And then uh, as was mentioned during the presentation, um, it just continues to improve. So every release that's coming out is making it better and supporting new things that adding to the, the level of sophistication um, for the kind of development you can do in Angular with it. So it really is the standard uh, tool that's, that's used for Angular development. So tonight we took a look at the, the new development environment in this modern era and how Angular kind of fits in with that and what tools we need to be especially aware of to do Angular development. Uh, these tools are going to help us produce higher quality code. Um, we do have to learn this new language, TypeScript, but as was mentioned earlier, and what I've seen in many articles and heard a lot of is that most developers who have gone to typing or typed programming in their JavaScript using TypeScript have really come to appreciate the benefits uh, fairly quickly even. So if you've been holding out, I'd encourage you just to try and start to experiment with TypeScript and see some of these benefits that others are starting to realize because it really is mostly about the developer experience, not so much the user experience. But of course, it will help you produce a better user experience as well through higher quality code. Um, and the other thing I think we need to do just if we're doing any modern front end developer or front end development is to adopt some of these new programming techniques. So we need to understand modules and programming with ECMAScript 6 standards. Uh, but the nice thing is the Angular CLI really makes a lot of those things a breeze. So that's it for tonight. Uh, please join us for next our next session, which is going to be the same time next week. We're going to take a look at the new school of thought around how to even compose our user interfaces. We're going to see how that's quite a bit different from the way we may have approached our, our application development with AngularJS. And we're going to see how Angular really supports that thinking uh, which is just across the industry. It's not necessarily Angular's way, but Angular supports development in that style uh, very nicely. So thanks, everybody, for uh, your time, and thanks to the panelists for your great input. Thank you, Denny, for presenting. It was awesome. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome. That's my pleasure. Thanks.
Okay. So next week, same bat time, same bat channel. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Different batty right, panelists. Again, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have a good night, guys. Thank thanks. you. See you all next week. Okay. Bye.